If there's one survival lesson the Second World War burned into human history, it's this. Those who prepared below ground often lived to see the peace above it. In an age when cities turned to ash overnight, families who understood the science of shelter, the real, practical design of underground cellars, stood a far better chance of surviving than those who relied on luck. This isn't just another wartime curiosity. The design principles that saved entire families in the 1940s still hold value today for anyone serious about preparedness, off-grid living, or defense against modern threats. So let's dig into how ordinary people engineered underground safety and how you can apply the same methods with 21st century precision. When the first bombs started falling across Europe, there was no grand military blueprint for civilian survival. People improvised. Farmers, villagers and city families took to the earth because it was the one thing that could shield them when metal and fire rained from the sky. The earliest versions were nothing more than expanded root cellars, holes reinforced with timber, lined with clay, and sealed tight against gas or debris. But necessity turned these crude dugouts into ingenious defensive structures. In Britain, the Anderson and Morrison shelters became iconic, but rural families in Eastern Europe and Scandinavia took it further. They dug entire living spaces beneath their homes or in nearby fields, complete with air shafts, drainage systems and layered insulation. The principle was simple. Earth absorbs impact, muffles sound and stabilizes temperature. The deeper and smarter the design, the greater the chance of survival. At its core, an underground cellar works because of physics and thermal mass. A meter of compacted soil can absorb shock waves, stop shrapnel and deflect heat better than concrete alone. Temperature underground stays near a stable 10 to 12 degrees Celsius year-round, protecting not only human life, but also food stores, water and equipment. W. Foody engineers learned quickly that the shape mattered as much as the depth. Arch ceilings distributed pressure evenly, preventing collapse during near misses. Entrances were built at angles, never straight on, to reduce the chance of blast intrusion. Air filtration came from simple but effective systems. Pipes arranged in a loop, pulling fresh air down while venting stale air up, using nothing but natural draught. That same passive ventilation concept is used today in modern bunkers and off-grid shelters because it simply works. No electricity required. Most wartime families didn't have concrete mixers or blueprints. They had shovels, timber and old barrels. A typical Eastern European survival cellar started with a pit about two and a half metres deep and four metres wide. Walls were lined with logs set vertically, gaps sealed with clay to prevent water seepage. The roof was layered, first wooden beams, then straw, then a thick blanket of soil to absorb blast and insulate. A small vent pipe, often camouflaged with rocks or brush, allowed airflow. The floor was raised slightly on a layer of gravel to keep it dry during floods. Families stored canned goods, salted meat and potatoes down there. Some even installed crude sleeping bunks and makeshift stoves with flue pipes vented through concealed shafts. In Poland, Ukraine and parts of rural France, there are still preserved examples of these shelters. Some forgotten until modern archaeologists rediscovered them decades later, remarkably intact. If you're serious about preparedness today, these designs still have a lot to teach, honestly. 
First, start with terrain selection. High ground near a slope gives you natural drainage and stability, which is just so important. Avoid digging in clay-heavy soil that traps water, as that can cause all sorts of trouble. Use natural camouflage, shrubs, rock gardens, or even, say, a small shed to disguise entrances. Next comes the structure itself. Reinforce with modern materials, but do keep the World War II principle in mind. Flexible walls and rounded ceilings handle stress much better than rigid cubes. PVC pipes can easily replace tin vents these days, and modern vapour barriers do a fine job of preventing dampness. If you're building a root cellar or a storm shelter, it's wise to integrate dual entrances, one as the primary and one as an emergency escape shaft. This kind of redundancy, well, it saved countless lives when debris blocked exits during bombing raids. Finally, control the environment. World War II families used lime wash on walls to kill bacteria and reflect light from oil lamps. Nowadays, you can adapt this by using white paint and LED lights connected to a small solar system. For temperature control, earth tubes. Those are buried pipes that precondition air. Actually mimic those old passive vent systems, but with much greater efficiency. Right. So, step one is to identify a section of your property where digging won't compromise the foundations. Step two, you'll want to plan your dimensions, a minimum of two metres deep, with a ceiling arch or curved roof. Now, for step three, reinforce the structure using treated timber or cinder block and be sure to seal all joints with a waterproof membrane or bentonite clay. Step 4. Add a gravel base for drainage and construct your air circulation system using two vertical pipes, one intake near the floor and one exhaust near the ceiling, making sure they're spaced at least two metres apart. Finally, for Step 5, cover the exterior roof with at least half a metre of compacted soil and ideally some vegetation, both for insulation and, well, concealment. When done right, you'll have not just a survival structure, but a year-round storage space for food, tools and emergency gear. In the event of disaster, whether natural, political or economic, you're replicating a design tested under the most extreme conditions humanity has faced. Families who built these cellars weren't soldiers. They were ordinary people who refused to be victims. Their shelters became symbols of quiet defiance. Every brick and beam represented foresight and determination. For today's historians and preppers, that's the real takeaway. Preparedness is as much about mindset as it is about engineering. You build not because you expect disaster, but because history has already proven that the unprepared pay the highest price. So, the next time you see a patch of open ground or an unused corner of your property, think of those wartime builders. They didn't wait for orders. They dug, they reinforced, and they survived. Their legacy lives on every time someone decides to take their family's safety into their own hands. If you found this breakdown valuable, subscribe to Warfield Survival for more deep dive lessons drawn straight from history's toughest survivors. Share this with someone who needs to see how the past still holds the keys to modern survival. Because the best shelters aren't built in panic, they're built with knowledge.